Really? Maybe we take the whole team then. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la. Welcome everybody to the Sufian Society Nothing But Facts live stream on a day in which Monday is always a day we talk about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was born on a Monday. So Mondays tend to be the day for that. Uh, this is why Dilal al-Khairat, it's divided into days. He didn't divide into days, but later on, those people divide into days, and they start with Monday, because Monday is the day you start it off. You begin the Khairat on Monday, then you have seven Ahzab. Um, it's muggy, it's warm, but the sun is hiding a little bit. And the beauty of life in New Jersey is that the sun never hides permanently. It's, uh, it'll be out probably later today, and even if it doesn't, it'll be out tomorrow. And so by having a couple rainy or cloudy days, you actually makes you appreciate the sun even more. I want to start off with something hilarious, okay? There's a picture here. Oh, they, this is just so funny. This is perfect. Huh? No, no. I'm going to send you, I'm going to tell you the, this right now. A guy put this out there on the internet. He put his picture. And he got the shock of his life. When his daughter, and by the way, this is old. This is from December. It just got to me. I just, I'm just seeing it now. It's from last December. His daughter comes to him and says that she's now a boy. Ninth grade in high school. And she starts wearing, from, you know, boy clothes. So the mom is basically like having a heart attack. The dad, however, is a very chill dude who puts it in genius mode. He says to her, she says to him, let's have the conversation. She sits down. She says, I'm trans, right? With this bold attitude that they're teaching him to have with their parents. He said, I'm so glad you came out because I've been hiding it myself. I'm also trans, okay? But now that you came out with it, I'm coming out with it. And his wife is like, what's going on here? Next morning, she says to him, look, stop being sarcastic, right? And respect my decision. I said, okay, I respect it. And you respect mine. Reciprocal, right? She said, dad, you're not trans. He said, and who are you to say I'm not trans, right? Next morning, the guy goes in, puts a shirt and suit and tie on, okay? A shirt and tie. Puts on his running like uh, compression shorts that you wear under basketball shorts, but they're tight, right? Everything's showing. Then puts on his wife's stiletto shoes, heels, and then blotches makeup all over his face. He doesn't even know what he's doing, right? He's got a shaved head. Puts makeup all over his face. Stop being a bigot, he says to his daughter, and accept me for who I am, okay? Let's do this together. He goes... And she is shaking, right? She's shaking. And he's dropping her off to school. She said, stop me, stop me here. I'll walk the rest of the way. He said, no, no. Salam, I'm at Give Haruk. He says, no, I'm, I'm dropping you in. He goes and he starts waving at everyone like a female, right? Like he's taking it all the way. He's dialed it all the way up. The girl, she's got a hood over her face. She's so embarrassed. She's almost like yelling. Okay, she's fuming. Okay. Time for pickup. He does it again. He comes out, waving it out the all the all the girls, shaking his hips, looking absolutely absurd, right? Okay. The girl gets in the car fuming. This is not funny, blah, 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 blah. blah. He, and he's like, excuse me, call you call me by my pronouns. And he's going all and you're a bigot. I'm trans. You know how they get hysterical and they go crazy? He starts getting like that in the car at his daughter, right? You can't reason. Like when, when you get to a level, you can't reason with somebody. He says, next morning, she's done with the whole trans thing. Begs me to stop. Trade. You stop, I'll stop, right? And she stops. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So uh, that's what we start. I got to start off with. And I found that to be hilarious. Genius mode. Now let's listen to this. 
email. This has to do with today's topic. Today's topic is going to involve the seven times in which the city of Medina or the grave of the Prophet وسلم, was plotted against and those who stood up for it. But first, listen to this email that I received. Dear sir, I am writing to correct some potential misunderstandings you have about the eminent leader of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan. He's beloved. Oh, by the way, isn't today Pakistan Independence Day? All right, congratulations to everyone who... Um, one of the few countries explicitly based, built, or, or established for uh, Muslims, right? The eminent leader of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan, he has, in fact, defended the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the United Nations. So we have to be fair here because we said about him last week that, of course, maybe his going against that sheikh brought some, you know... Uh, bad results to him. And by the way, that's a speculation. No one can know for sure, but it's just the timing is a little bit. Uh, but they're saying, no, 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 it's not any of that. He, in fact, we are aware, the, the writer of the letter says, that he loves Alama Khadim Hussein Rizvi and that it was security forces that harmed him without his permission. Is that believable? I'm sure these states are huge. Different people are calling shots and it's possible, Right. If you would be so kind as to relay this to your audience, I have added a transcript of the pertinent part of his UN speech. We deem Imran Khan to be somebody who has been locked up simply for speaking the truth. And he start, But we do know he was trying to stop all this corruption and nonsense and shenanigans. And of course, they lock you up if you do that. So is that a possibility for sure? <laughs> okay. And uh, what's better to believe? The Husn of Van, someone tells me, no, 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 he was innocent of all this. Because we don't actually know what happens behind the scenes. We just can speculate. If you're going to speculate, you might as well speculate on Husn of Van. You'll never be guilty in the sight of Allah. But if you speculate on the false, on something that where someone is deemed to be uh, guilty, and they're not guilty of that, then you're guilty. Right? So specu if it's all speculation, you might as well go on Husn of Van. Now listen to this. This is Imran Khan's speech uh, to the United Nations, and he's going to go down in history with the people who defended the Prophet ﷺ with their tongue, because you can defend him with your body, your tongue, or like all of us, just with the heart, because we have no say in the world. Uh, and some people don't write, they don't talk. My third point, says Imran Khan, is about Islamophobia. There are 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. They live across all continents. It has grown since 9-11. Islamophobia has grown since 9-11. Muslim women wearing hijab are now treated as a problem. It's seen as a weapon. A Muslim can take off her clothes in some countries, but she cannot put more on, he's asking. And why has this happened? Because certain Western leaders equated Islam with terrorism. What is radical Islam? There is only one Islam. There is no radical Islam. There is one Islam, and that is the Islam of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a good answer. Why is there Islamophobia? How on average American differentiate between a modern and a radical? This has nothing to do with our religion. We have faced Islamophobia while traveling abroad in European countries. It is marginalizing Muslim communities. Marginalization creates room for and leads to radicalization. My point here is that we must address this. After 9-11, war against radical Islam started. Rather than Muslim leaders trying to explain to the West that there is no such thing as radical Islam. Okay, there are radical fringes in every society, but the basis of all religion is compassion and justice. And fortunately, the Muslim leaders are unable to explain this. We failed as the Muslim world to explain that there is no such thing as radical Islam. In Pakistan, we were the eye of the storm, and our government coined the term enlightened moderation regarding suicide attacks, because 9-11 bombers did suicide attacks. All sorts of theories came out like those about virgins in heaven. This bizarre thing happened where suicide attacks were equated with Islam. No one bothered researching the Tamil Tigers or the Japanese kamikaze bombers. No one blamed religion when they carried out suicide attacks, and rightly so because no religion teaches this violence. Most important thing I want to say. Uh, to explain Islam, we played cricket in the West, and I know how the Western mind works. One of the reasons for Islamophobia in 1989 was a book published to malign our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Put a picture up so everyone knows what we're talking about. Yeah, 
him standing at the U.S. podium so they know what we're talking about. The West could not understand what the problem was. By the way, for all those joining in, we're reading Imran Khan's speech at the U.N. The West could not un- uh, understand, what was this, like 2019, 2018 maybe? The West could not understand what the problem was. They don't look at religion the way we do. In their eyes, Islam is intelligent religion, and this became a watershed moment. And every two, three years, someone maligns our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Muslims react, and the West terms this intolerance. I blame some people in the West who provoke Muslims, but this is where a majority of the Muslim leaders let the Muslim community down. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the witness to our divine book, the Qur'an. The Prophet is the ideal to, uh, uh, we want to live up to. He created the state of Medina, which was a welfare state. I hear such strange things about Islam that it is against women and minorities. The state of Medina was the first that took responsibility for women. Widows, the poor. State announced all humans were equal, whatever their skin color. The Prophet wasallam announced that one of the greatest deeds was to emancipate a slave. But if you have to, treat them as an equal member of the family. And as a result, of the unprecedented happened. Slaves became kings in the Islamic world, which is, he's talking about the Mamluk dynasty. Okay? And slave dynasties were formed. So that is, again, the Mamluks. In Egypt, the Mamluks, I believe they were Circassians, right? And they were taken as slaves, uh, probably through wars that happened with the Ottomans, and then they trickled down, okay? Because the origin of slavery is always wars, where you're allowed to kill the person. So if you capture them, you benefit from their uh, uh, from their um, uh, labor. And then eventually the slave class, the Mamluks, rose up to become the leaders. In Islam, it was a sacred duty to protect places of worship of all religions. It was announced that all human beings were equal. The fourth caliph of Medina lost a court case against a Jewish citizen. All right? No one was above the law. When a Muslim community is unjust to a minority... It is going against the teaching of our religion. Our Prophet him lives in our hearts, and when he is maligned, it hurts us. I always imagine that what I would say and educate the world about Islam if I ever stood on this forum. In Western society, the Holocaust is treated with sensitivity because it hurts the Jewish community. So that's the same respect we ask for. Do not hurt our sentiments about maligning our Prophet him. This is all we ask. Now on a move to talk about Kashmir. Okay, so that's the end of his section on the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Um, Omar is watching a video. Is that, who is that at the bottom there? Not Sheikh Asrar, is it? No, that's someone else. Maybe we'll start in the second video. Because someone mentioned in the chat. Um, okay. So apparently he wanted to create an institution for religious learning with input from Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Yeah. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. And uh, he held a YouTube podcast with him. Yeah, he did. And I actually saw this. Like, uh, he really focused on spirituality. Like yeah. Sufism. He was big on that. So like, he yeah. He wanted to teach him uh, wanting to. Your mic is on, right? Okay. So he wanted to push Sufism like really hard in the universities. I remember watching it. Yeah. So he, because his wife is a, uh, I heard about uh, that she is um, a type of teacher of Tissot. Uh So that 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 is it. And if we're gonna have insaf, then hopefully, inshallah, uh, we will side on the side of the truth, and we won't have anything against us on the day of judgment for speculating ill will or speculating. Uh, the negative on somebody. Now let's move. This is correlated with this because the topic of today is the topic of the attacks that have happened on Medina. Okay. When we have attacks on um, Medina, the fr- the two of them that we're going to discuss were physical. Take care, my man. Uh and one of them, and five of them, were attacks on the grave of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that's what we're going to talk about. No, no, put on five twenty-eight statement from the UN. Yeah. All right. So the first one is you have to know this in Islamic history. It's called the Battle of Al Harra, and it took place after the martyrdom of Sayyidina Al Hussein and Yazid, son of Muawiyah out of Damascus, needed to temper the anger and quell and cool the anger of Ahlin Medina, the people of Medina, uh, against the Prophet uh, uh, sorry, against him, against Damascus and against the Bani Umayyah. Because after al Hussein was killed, you remember that al Hassan and Hussein, where did they settle? After al Hassan uh, gave the... Uh, Khilafah abdicated the Khilafah to Muawiyah. He moved back to Medina. 
So Al Hassan and Hussein were residents of Al Medina, Al Munawwara, at that time. Then Al Hassan moved, of course, Al Hassan was poisoned. Sayyidina Al Hussein went in year 60, eventually moved up to uh, Iraq to face off with the Bani Umayyah or to uh, rally his tr- uh, people and his troops in Kufa and was martyred there. So Al Hussein and his family, they were residents of Medina. Then they were residents of Mecca for some period of time. So Mecca and Medina became inflamed with an anger after the martyrdom of Hussein. So who were the two great leaders at that time? Of course, Abdullah ibn Zubair had positioned himself in Mecca. So that left a bit of a vacuum in uh, Medina. Of course, we know that Abdullah ibn Omar renounced all political activity and he retained that position. Likewise, Ali Zain al Abidin ibn al Hussein, son of al Hussein, had also renounced all political activity. But the youth who was had risen up and become a man and a leader was the son of the Sahabi Handala al Ghasil. Of course, we know that Handala had married, and on the night of, he that he married that night, the next morning there was a call to arms. He went before he could even take his ghusl. So he went and he died in that state so that malaika washed him. The Prophet ﷺ told us he saw this. Okay. So he is somebody who, that boy that was conceived upon that, okay, that night was Abdullah. Okay. Abdullah ibn al-Handala. Al-Ghasil. So Yazid calls upon the leaders and he calls upon a handful of leaders of Medina to come and visit him in Damascus. So they all go and they visit him in Damascus. And there Yazid showers gifts of gold upon them and he gives a bag with 10,000 gold coins to Handala and he gives 1,000 gold coins to everybody else, Abdullah bin Handala. And they all look at him and they, they wonder what is he doing? What is Abdullah bin Handala going to do with the money? And they see that he reaches his hand and he accepts the money. So they then reach their hand, they accept the money. And they take his acceptance of the money as a signal that we're at peace. So everybody relaxes. Okay. On the way out, after they had a wonderful meeting with Yazid, and they ate and they broke bread and then they, they talked, everyone was happy in the court of Yazid. The people of Medina, they had a leader. The leader decided to take the money. That's a signal that he accepted the gift and we're all good. On the way out, afterwards, you have like a debrief, right? You see what everyone thought. They said to him, what do you think? Knowing that he, was, he took the money and all is good. He said, by Allah, if it's me and my sons only against his whole army, we're going to go fight. Now, all the leaders now were shocked. Oh, then why'd you accept the money? He said, I'm gonna, I accepted the money so I could use it to raise an army against him. So Abdullah ibn Hanbala goes back to Medina with the intent to snuff out the Umayyads out of Medina. And he goes straight to the masjid and he gives a speech. And in that speech, he takes his turban off and he says, I have renounced... And the Arabic word for renounce is synonymous to remove. I have removed the hand of allegiance from Yazid just as I removed this turban from my head. And he threw it. And that was a symbol back in the day to renounce allegiance is by taking off something that you're wearing. So the mosque became filled. Everyone threw in the pile whatever they were wearing. Just as, And they, of course they collected again, but it was just as a symbol and a show that as the clothes piles up, of how many people have renounced the allegiance, and they say there was like a hill of garments. Everyone in Medina followed, except for a handful of people, and they are Abdullah bin Omar, Al Ali ibn Al Hussein Zain al Abidin, and Muhammad al Ibn al Hanafiya, who was the younger brother of Al Hussein and the uncle of Ali Zain al Abidin from his father's side. And he's called Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyyah because Sayyidina Ali, after Sayyidina Fatima, married a woman from the Hanif tribe. So she's Hanafiyyah. 
and he is known and, and demarcated as Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya so that it's demarcated that he's not the son of Fatima. Okay. Uh, and, but also he cannot accept zakat either. Okay. So he's not the son of Fatima Zahra, so he's not directly connected to the Prophet in that way, but he's the son of Ali. So he is connected to the Prophet in that re regard. And all the sons of Abi Talib and the grandchildren of Abdul Muttalib do not accept zakat in our religion. Okay. Because that is the technical definition of Ahlul Bayt. Anyone who shares, the lineage goes back to Abdul Muttalib. Okay. So, the strategy is to, if immediately is to, 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 to stifle the capital building. So they go, it's not, of course not a capital building as we know it, but they go to where the Umayyad center of power is. And ironically, whose house is that? Marwan ibn al-Hakam. And we remember that Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he was the reason that got everyone to surround Uthman's house, Sayyidina Uthman's house. Because when the fitna happened in the time of Sayyidina Uthman, initially, they were not against Sayyidina Uthman. They were, their grievance, and the man they wanted was Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who forged the letter to commit murder. He forged it in the name of Sayyidina Uthman, but it was Marwan's handwriting, and they came to that conclusion very quickly. And it was Sayyidina Ali who came to that conclusion. And he shared it to the people. It's Marwan. It's not Sayyidina Uthman. And they all surrounded the house of Sayyidina Uthman to get to Marwan because Marwan was staying with Uthman. Now, the tide has turned, and what goes around comes around. And Marwan ibn Hakim's house is surrounded by all of these people. Because the first step is to cut off all Umayyad communication. Now, there was another grievance beyond Yazid. And that was that in the time of the Bani Umayyah, the Umayyad people had purchased a lot of land in Medina during a drought. And they got it at like one-tenth of the price. And this angered a lot of people. They felt that this was unfair. You don't come to a people during a drought and buy everything from them at that price, right? At a low price because people are so desperate. Some in Medina said the land was confiscated. So there was some ittirab, unknown exactly what, uh, how the land was acquired, but it was a source of anger for these Medinan farmers that this precious land was lost to them. And the Umayyads sent their own people to work the land not non medinans so there was this foreign body there working the land that was theirs so there was a, a financial grievance here too that was an unjust acquisition of territory of land so the second strategy was to disallow them to benefit from this land and to pick fights anytime that one of these workers sought to to harvest the crops or to pluck the crops out you stop them physically that's your land. So they started, they did that. They closed off Mar Marwan's house and where the Umayyads gathered. And they went off and they started to pick fights with these foreign farmers, Umayyad farmers, to protect their land. Then they received a letter. And here's the interesting thing. Yazid had a soldier at this time named by the name of Muslim Ibn Uqba. Muslim ibn Uqba at the time, here's where it gets really interesting and almost Hollywood-like. Who is Muslim ibn Uqba? Now, this is almost like, if you, you know, that in Kufa, he sent ibn Ziyad. Well, he reached out for ibn Ziyad again. He said, ibn Ziyad, well, I got another mission for you. Ibn Ziyad said, oh, last time we killed Hussein, we got the lana of the whole ummah against us, I'm out. Okay? So he reaches for Muslim ibn Uqba, who is... Ironically, the brother, the maternal brother of Abdullah bin Hanbala. He's his maternal brother. And he sends him and he says, go down to Medina. Tell them we don't want to spill any more blood. Like this, when they assassinated and they murdered, they, they killed al Hussein the way they did. Like the whole Ummah hated them. And the news spread. They, just, they were despised. They were reeling from that. Even the Umayyads have to deal with public, uh, uh, you got to deal with the uh, public perception. So he said, look, this time try to avoid bloodshed. They got, and tell them they have three days to return to obedience. 
if they do come back. If they don't, then you fight them, and I permit you three days to do as you wish in the city of Medina. And this was a for an ancient practice that once a city is defeated, to permanently break them, you allow the soldiers to rape and pillage. Rape, kill, steal. Basically, it's, all, it's a free-for-all. Anything's yours. The women are yours. The money is yours. The homes are yours. The possessions are yours. Children, horses, whatever you want is yours. This is in the old day how you would break a nation or break a city. Of course, it's haram. But he gave him permission to do it. And that is Muslim Ibn Uqba. So he gets there, and the first two parts of uh, Abdullah bin Hamdallah's plan are working out. But now, uh, they want to, the third part is to remove all Medi Umayyad people out of the city. Marwan, everybody, anyone who was a sympathizer with the Bani Umayyah, get them out of the city and seal the city from the Bani Umayyah. Now this is the part that he's got to fight to do this. Musa ibn Aqba comes down with a massive army, 10,000 people, an army of 10,000 people upon the city of Medina. And this is exactly like Al-Khandaq, same amount of people. So what do they do? They mimic the strategy of Al-Khandaq and they dig a ditch all around the city of Medina. Okay. Nonetheless, they're able to communicate and the ditch doesn't work. And Muslim ibn Aqil writes him a letter. Uh, sorry, Mus uh, Muslim ibn Aqba writes him a letter. And he says, you have three days to return to obedience. And the three days pass. And Abdullah bin Handala writes back a letter. And he says, we're not returning. It's a fight. They meet at Al-Harra, which is part of the outside of Medina where the Jews used to live. And they meet there, and it's not even a contest. The Umayyads kill them all. And Imam Malik says about this, that in the Battle of Al-Harra, 700 scholars who can give fatwa were killed. 700 scholars were killed. Okay. And after that battle, the three days ensue. The three days of raping, pillaging, and murdering. Uh, Az Zuhri says the number of dead surpassed 10,000. In just in the three days, not in the battle, in the three days. So these three, three days, all of this is unlawful. The, the, the battle is done with. But this was an old technique to break a city and make sure their population never rebels again and learns their lesson and is essentially traumatized from rebellion. Okay, that, and, and this happens even like in Syria, when certain groups rose up, political Islamic groups rose up against Hafiz al-Assad, he went, and I think he sent, this is before the era of everything being recorded, but from what I read, he sent in planes. And he sent in, uh, dropped bombs on Hama and fighter jets that would shoot down, like indiscriminately. And it's reported that up to 30,000 people were killed. The massacre, hey, can you look that up? The massacre of Hama by Hafiz al Asad. And I remember one time when um, someone was talking to a Syrian scholar about, you know, political Islam and the uprising and let's, let's get the Khilafah and let's rule by Islam and let's remove these oppressive rulers. He became infuriated. He said, do you know how many orphans are there are in Hama? Like, you guys are just talking and you don't know that we're not dealing with a fair, this is not a fair chess match here. And he was infuriated. He's like, you, you're all talking. You don't know what you're saying because you don't know what the consequences are. So you are liable. If you know that someone is going to lash out and rape and kill and produce orphans and widows and you instigate that, you're, you're, you might be responsible for that. Okay. So this is what happened. It is said in all the books that nine months later, 1,000 children were born. These are the children of the rape, of the zina, of the, the rapes that occurred. So if there were a thousand kids, that means a thousand women were raped. That's the thousand women who conceived that day. Not every woman is going to be conceiving that day, right? So imagine how many women were raped. Now you are now, you are dealing with somebody who permitted this, okay? 
So you are dealing with a group of people that have strayed so far from Islam that they're going to go to the city of Medina and no one to do this. The Salah was not established in the city for three days. No event. The Salah meaning in the message of the Prophet said, no event. And the mosque was used as a stable. Like they just put their horses in the mosque. Like that is how far from uh, the, the, from the deen that they went. After that, they moved to Mecca. They moved on to Mecca. After the three days was over, they moved on to Mecca. Shortly into that siege, Yazid died. And they had to pull back the siege and go back and, and recoup everything in Damascus. And so Abdullah ibn Zubair was able to rule over Mecca for about nine years until the Bani Umayyah selected Hajjaj ibn Yusuf to go and fight them, and they did fight them. Okay. Can Sayyids today accept Zakat? No, they cannot. Provided that a person has a record, and there are records, okay? There are many, many records of who are Ahl al-Bayt and who isn't, okay? And if you have that record and that documentation and your family keeps that documentation, then you're not allowed to accept Zakat. Okay, now let's go to the next attempt on al Madinah al Munawwara, and this time it's not an attempt on the city. It's an attempt by the Crusaders on the Prophet. Okay. Oh, sorry, the Ismailis. Now, who are the Ismailis? Just so that you can. Um, did you get that Battle of Al Harra information? Not, there aren't accurate reports. There are no accurate reports because back in those days you didn't have yeah. statistics the way we have it now. Now so it's saying like two thousand to forty thousand. Yeah, which is way off. So the highest number, according to what Yassin found, was forty thousand people killed in the bat in the rip, in the uh, put down of Al Ham of Hama in Syria. Now, uh, just so you know, the names of these sects in Islam, there are three Shi'i sects. And they are based on how many imams they believe in. The first Shi'i sect are the Fivers, also known as the Zaydis, and they're in Yemen. The second Shi'i sect are the Seveners, and they are the Ismailis because they believe in Ismail is the last uh, imam that they believe in. And the Ismailis are also known as Baltinis and also known as Fatimis. Okay? So Ismaili, Baltini, and Fatimi, same thing. And today, what are they called? Bahoris. So this sect has four names. They're known by four names. Ismailis, Baltinis, Fatimis, and Bahoris. Okay? And the third Shia sect are the Twelvers. Because they believe in 12 Imams. And they're also known as the Imamis. Now, the Shia groups all started were Arabs in the beginning. And the our only Arabs left that are she are the Lebanese. Okay. And they are Imamis. And the Zaydis, of course, Yemenis. But it was not a common thing that they, they were Persian back in the day or in the subcontinent, as it is known today, the majority of them. So where did the Ismailis come from? They came from Tunisia. And they conquered Egypt. And the Fatimi Empire ruled over Egypt for a couple hundred years. Malik Fiqh was eliminated from Egypt for that many for that long. And then Ibn Shas brought it back. Okay. Now, the Ismailis then and the Fatimis in the if you were to go back to the uh, season like three of Islamic history, right? It's the it's Salah al Din, it's Nur al Din, Salah al Din, the Crusaders, and the Fatimis. There are two bad guys. There are two antagonists, the Fatimids in Egypt and the Crusaders of Jerusalem. Okay. And Ahl Sunnah, the, the Zengids, and then later on the Ayyubids are in Syria. Okay. So they're fighting Jerusalem and Egypt. Now, by this time, Thomas Salah Hadin, they were weak, but there was a time when they were strong. The Fatimids were strong. And this takes us to 386 after the Hijri. You all remember the assassins, 
the the fa- the famous group little cult from within the Fatima is known as the assassins and that word comes from hashashin the hashashin is the source of the word assassin and the hashashin were people who used to uh, smoke hashish but they also used to kill notable sunnis their their goal was to assassinate them that group has gone on to in today's history according to some of the books to be a, a sect of the ismailis called the nizaris and the nizari ismailis are not muslims at all and we know that the buhoris are in we consider them innovators in islam there are rulings towards innovators okay when you innovate in the doctrine and you alter core tenets but not the widely spread known by necessity tenets of Islam, then you're an innovator. But the Nizaris have negated the widely known tenets of Islam, such as Salah, Zakah, Hajj. All of this has been corrupted by them to the point that Hajj is to visit their Aga Khan, not the Prophet. Why do they not Hajj? Mecca. Why is their, their, their logic is that the purpose of Hajj was to meet the Prophet, not to go to Mecca. So therefore, you want to make Hajj, you visit the Aga Khan, okay? And so that's what they believe about Hajj. No, you believe that stuff, you're, you're out of Islam, okay? Second, and, and Aga Khan, the reason people say that, and people get giddy when you say that, he gives you too much material for mockery, right? This is like, a, this is like they've become a semi, a, a Daisy British royal family type of thing, right? And that's what they are, Okay. That's what the Aga Khan is. He's marrying a different white woman every six months and divorcing, okay? And uh, he's always on jet skis and he's always on yachts and there's no Islam at all. He's basically like a, a CEO of a vast empire of wealth and there, and he's always wearing some tuxedo with some British uh, notable. Uh, it's, it's So it gives you people a lot of uh, material to look at this person and say, really, what kind of religion is this, Okay. Um, so that's the, that's the, uh, that, that's the, a strand of the Ismailis known as the Aga Khan, also known as the Nizaris, and they're very high placed in everywhere. Like they, they're big donors to Harvard. And as a result of that, Harvard has an Aga Khan, you know, chair there and a, and a professorship. And there is uh, a, a man there. He, he basically teaches, um, is Ismailism there? It's because of the money, right? Not, and why? Why else? Why would I, uh, why would Harvard care about some small sect unless that sect is a big donor? So that group is called the Nizari Aga Khani type of Ismailis, and they're out of Islam altogether. And the Bahoris don't answer to them, and the Bahoris also think they're out of Islam. So that tells you that we're not we're not going to some extreme. The Bahoris themselves d- denounce them. Okay, Bahori Ismailis are innovative sects. But they pray, they fast, they 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 look Muslim, etc. Okay. Now, in Egypt, around the year three hundred eighty-six, there was a man named Al Hakim bi Amrillah, the Donald Trump of the Fatimid Empire, a kook job, right? But they were strong and they dominated. Al Hakim bi Amrillah was very much like. Um, I know maybe some people will get upset with me I say, but Akbar uh, Akbar, and he's like playing around with religion making up his own religion he also made up claims about himself at Hakim bi Amrillah in Egypt made up claims about himself that he was like the guided one the Mahdi blah 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 well one of the reasons that Al Hakim bi Amrillah wanted to elevate one of the ways I wanted to elevate Egypt was he wanted to make the tomb of the Prophet Sallallahu in Egypt he wanted to relocate the tomb of the Prophet ﷺ from Medina to Egypt. Okay. And the ulama needed actually, uh, 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 when, the, when the sultan, and he now, I think he ruled over Mecca too. They needed a ruling around this. And they came upon the Quran, Surah At-Tawbah. أَلَا تُقَاتِلُونَ قَوْمًا Will you not fight a people? نَكَثُوا أَيْمَانَهُمْ They betrayed their trust. وَهَمُّ بِإِخْرَاجِ الرَّسُولِ Okay. And they intended, they put in their, all their effort to remove the Prophet. This is when the Prophet was in life. Imagine now the sanctity of death. 
right? So how did he want to do this? Okay. He sent a, a governor named Abu al-Futuh, and he said, you're now the new governor of Medina. Go get the body of the prophet and bring it back here. Like that's it openly. Okay. No fear. No concern. The residents of Medina heard about this, and of course they went and they physically attacked Abu al-Futuh, and Abu al-Futuh became extremely scared. He said, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Okay. In the meantime, a storm came, a sandstorm came, and all of the animals and the tents and the, and the homes of all those who were coming, obviously if you have a, if you have a normal home, you can just seek refuge there. But these are people who came from Egypt in temporary house, temporary homes, tents, and they had their animals. They just couldn't take it anymore, and they left. So that's the end of the first attempt to take the grave of the Prophet. It was out in the open. Al-Hakim bi Amrillah went out in the open, said, I'm sending Abu Futuh. I want to make Egypt the center of the Islamic world. Qahira the, was a city founded by the Fatimid Ismailis. Al-Azhar was originally meant to train Fatimiyya Shi'i Imams, and it was the little courtyard of the king as king's palace where they used to give classes. So that was that's the end of the first attempt. Al-Hakim bi Amrillah went and lived on, and in 411, he tried to do it again. Ibn Sa'dun reports in his book that Hakim, Al-Hakim bi Amrillah sent some people to carry out his evil plan. These people started residing in a house near the Prophet's mosque. And this time they wanted to do it covertly. Okay. More Shi'i methodology here. Okay. So they rented a house next to the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they began digging. Digging and digging and digging and digging. Okay. And at this time, somebody who was walking by heard a, a, a sound, a voice saying, your prophet's grave is being dug. So he told one, hey, did you hear that? And the person said, yes, I heard that. Did you hear that? Yes, I heard that. So they went and they, uh, lightning struck near a house and a little flame came up. They said, well, this must be the house. So they went there, banged on the door, got in, okay, and saw a huge ditch that was being dug down into from the, their house and over into the grave of the Prophet wasallam, And they took them all out and killed them. Okay. Uh, when we talk about Al-Hakim bi Amrillah, he has his masjid now, of course, is a, it's a regular mosque in Egypt. It's an ancient masjid. Al-Hakim bi Amrillah, an offshoot cult developed called the Druze people. The Druzies, I guess you can call them. And they're in Lebanon. And they're like, it's not even Islam to them. It's just like some kind of thing that binds them together. They have no, re- yeah, it's like a cultural, there's no religion there. But Lebanese people uh, will know what we're talking about when we say Durzi. Okay, and the, the Druze people are, Basically, f- the believers that Hakim bi Amrillah was the Mahdi and that he's going to come back and save everybody someday. Of course, nobody really believes that, but that was the origin of the myth of the Druze. So you see how all these groups are all connected. Okay. All these groups are connected. There are Druze in Israel. Uh, so, so Druze, Nizari, Ismaili assassins, these people are something else completely. The Bahoris are the descendants of the Ismailis today. All right. Yeah, they believe in reincarnation. And by the way, this is a thing that, I just have to say this for uh, some people in the Arab world, that, that reincarnation is for some reason a thing now. It's a it's a trend to, to talk about this. And they call it Tanasukh al-Arwah. Tanasukh al-Arwah means that your, it's reincarnation, basically. Your soul, you die, you're going to be born again in the body of somebody else. So, And of course, that's a, a kufri belief. No, we're not allowed to believe in that. You, have, you are one self, and you're going to be judged on the Day of Judgment directly. You're going to go from here to the, ju- the abode of judgment. You're not going to come back in this hayat dunya It's the direct contradiction of the Qur'an. Anyone who believes that is, is um, contradicting 
I think something you could say it's known in religion by necessity that you're only one person, right? You're not going to live as another person. When the Shiuch of Egypt put a video and he said, he said uh, that he met one of these people and he said, so are you telling me that I might have been Napoleon, right? So in any event, all of these spiritual sayings are just guesses because like ha- wh- where's your source of knowledge about the soul and about this thing? What's your source? It's all just speculation. Now, what's the third attempt? The next two attempts are going to be by Christian crusaders. So we move from the Fatimids to the crusaders. And now it's the year 557 after the Hijra. And this is an amazing story. And the, probably the best documented of all the stories. The best doc because it happened later on. It's documented. And the story starts in Damascus, Syria. In the room of Nur al-Din zingi in the middle of the night, he wakes up. Having had a dream of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, pointed to two yellow-haired people and said, save me from these two. So Nur al-Din zingi uh, didn't know what this dream meant, went to sleep again. He didn't know what that, that dream meant because how would he save the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after his passing? So he slept. Did you want this bookmark here, by the way? Okay. He slept again, and he saw the dream yet a second time. The same exact dream. The Prophet said, said, save me from these two people. He slept again, again, perplexed. He saw the dream a third time. This time he said, he doesn't know what this is, but he can't sleep anymore. He goes and he makes wudu, and he goes down to the musalla, the masjid of the palace. And it's before Fajr. It's a, a way before Fajr. Lo and behold, who does he see there at the masjid, his advisor? So think about this. Nur al-Din wakes up on a random night to go make tahajjud in the mosque. And his advisor is already there, praying tahajjud. That's why they were who they were. And Habib Omar bin Hamid, who lives in the Emirates, used to always say, Whenever the Muslims succeeded, their kings were Abdel and Aqtab and Awliya. And he pointed out Nur al-Din al-Zingi and Salah al-Din al-Ayubi. He said they were not just righteous kings, they were Awliyaullah and Abdel who prayed to Hajjud regularly. So Nur al-Din Zingi goes down to the mosque of the palace and finds an advisor still there, or already there. And he tells his advisor of the dream and his advisor says, why are you here? Move, Go. So they pray Fajr, and Nur al-Din announces to his group, let's go, uh, and uh, we're going down to, uh, to Medina. Gather, and now pack all the money, gifts, everything. We go to Medina, we bring gifts. Immediately goes to Medina, goes straight to the Master of the Prophet, وسلم, gives a speech to the people, and says, I want everybody, all men of Medina, to come and came, claim a gift from me. That's how he's going to see these two men. Every single man of Medina must come and take a gift from me. So... People come, and no blonde people show up. He then uh, starts asking around, has anyone seen two blonde people? Well, I say, yeah, there are two blonde guys. They say that they're from Morocco coming to make hedge, right? Coming down from Morocco over to go make hedge. And he says, bring them. So they, they say, come and get your gift from Nuruddin. They said, no, we're not poor. We don't need a gift. He said, no, come anyway. They come. He looks at them. He talks to them. It's not a Moroccan accent. Okay. He said, tell me the truth of why you're here. He said, no, 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 just, just making hajj. He said, okay. He ha- follows them back and he has their home investigated. He goes himself into the home and then they put their arms up and they said, no, no, no. you got us. We, were, we are Christians. We have been sent by the king of, the, we were of, the, of Jerusalem to come dig up the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they do they investigate the house and they find a huge hole that goes down into a tunnel that they formed, right? And they were actually getting there, right? So they had dug it down and take a ladder, you go down and you keep digging and digging and digging and digging. And so of course he has them executed and he then digs a circle he orders for a whole circle to be dug around the Prophet ﷺ in which they would put um, 
melt down some metal and put it in uh, put it there so that it would form a metal wall molten lead and and nobody could nobody would be able to dig so that was the third attempt on the the city of Medina and the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Remember, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has a special hadith about Medina. Man ahdatha fil Medina ti hadatha aw awa muhdithan faalehi laanatullah wal malaika wal nasi ajmain. Whosoever creates in Medina a fitna or supports one of these people a fitna, upon him is the curse of Allah and the angels and all the people. Okay. Next, the fourth attempt is also the Crusaders. Ibn Jubair says, it's the year 578 after the Hijrah. He said, I arrived in Alexandria on the 29th of Dhul Hijjah, 578 after the Hijrah, during my excursion tour of Egypt. We left Alexandria on the 8th. Right? And there we saw a huge crowd of people coming out of their homes okay, to see Roman prisoners. Christian prisoners. And these prisoners were bought on animals facing the back of the animal. That's how you humiliate somebody. You know somebody's being humiliated in the old world. He's put to the back of the animal. Okay? People were coming out, playing bugles, banging on sticks and things, just making a, a big, uh, you know, hoopla about this. Okay? We inquired about them. And we were given a detailed picture of their crimes. All right, so what were the crimes of these people? The Christians of Syria had began to do all sorts of mischief, and they wanted to disrupt the Hajj, and they wanted to disrupt the city of the Prophet wasallam. And they succeeded on the first one by burning down the warehouse of food in Jeddah, that the pilgrims would come, collect their Zad, Zad means sustenance, and keep going. They come from Jeddah, from the west, or from the north, even, okay, northwest. Collect their their sustenance there. Rest at Jeddah and come down. They burn that down. Okay, the storage of food. Okay, and they killed and they fought, and there was all sorts of riots and all sorts of fighting. And then they headed towards Medina. Okay, and when they were about one day away from Medina. Okay. The famous Hajib al-Lu'lu' Hajib al-Lu'lu' came with a few Moroccan youths who were experts okay, in sea warfare and in fighting. And they were like their own version of their own Texas Rangers. Like Texas Rangers, the, the, their own justice team, basically. And they weren't part of any army. They were just on their own. Uh, they would protect the Muslims against the Christians. And they fought with these Christians. And they took some as prisoners. Okay. And the prisoners, when they were brought forth, they had admitted that their goal was to remove the body of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from the sacred chamber. Okay. They admitted that after being caught. And so this team of Moroccans, Hijab, Hajib al Lu'lu, his name was. And this is almost like the Texas, you know, in America we have, they, they used to have the Texas Rangers who were basically semi-official and they could go around and make sure that gangsters were kept at bay. All right. And that's what this Moroccan group was. They would travel around, see what the, who the crusaders are bothering, and they would fight them. So Moroccans for the win. The fifth attempt the fifth attempt is now by Shias again, and it's not against the Prophet directly, but it would have been an offense to the grave of the Prophet them, because a Shia ruler decided to remove Abu Bakr and Umar from next to the Prophet them. Okay, And the head of the service personnel of the Prophet them, was Shamsuddin Sawab al-Lamti. He was a very gentle and kind person who had monitored the Prophet's mosque for decades. Okay. And he was essentially in charge of the buildings and grounds of the mosque of the Prophet. 
And so the ruler of Medina had accepted a bribe to allow a group of people to come in and remove Abu Bakr and Omar from the grave, the sacred chamber. So he received a letter. He said, you have been called to talk to the, the governor. He goes and talks to the governor. And he says to the governor, the governor says to him, some people are coming after Aisha when the mosque closes. When they come, you let them in and you don't say anything. You let them do whatever they need to do. Okay? He says, okay. He doesn't know what this is all about. Word spreads one person to another that something bad is going to happen in Medina. Okay? Something shady is being planned. Okay? So, now Shamsuddin Thawab al is sitting, waiting, and he knows that he's at the center of this. And he gets the knock on the door after Aisha, and he's there and he's ready. He opens the door, lo and behold, what does he see? He sees about 15 to 20 people carrying shovels and pickets and, and construction material. Okay? And he opens the door to them, and he can't do anything. They just march straight in. Okay? He, he doesn't know whether, what they were going to do. But he now sees that they're going directly to the sacred chamber. And he says, it was not one or two steps when they were all in that the earth quaked inside the mosque and they were opened up and they all fell deep in. I looked down, I couldn't, they fell so deep, I couldn't see them anymore. And then the sand moved again and they were completely buried, these people. He's sitting there, he can't believe his eyes. Shortly thereafter, the ruler comes by to investigate what's going on. And he said, what happened? He says to the ruler, some people came, didn't know what they were, who they were. The earth opened up and buried them all. The ruler says, think before you speak. How could this happen? He says, come. And he shows him the ditch. And of course, things are, chandeliers are broken. Lamps have fallen. It's like a, an earthquake scene, right? It's not like a clean opening. Okay, It's an earthquake scene. He says to him, don't utter a word about this. And the ruler goes around saying simply that it's an earthquake. An earthquake happened and that's it. Okay. And so they start renovating the place. All right. SubhanAllah. As Samhudi says, Abu Muhammad Abdullah al-Mirghani has described this prop plot briefly in the history of Medina. Okay. SubhanAllah. And he says that the 1520 were swallowed by the earth when they had only gone a few steps into the sacred chamber. Okay. They were plotting and yet Allah plots. What is the plot of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is his punishment for those who plot. Okay. The one who openly does something, his punishment is going to be different than someone who plots. What's the difference? The one who openly comes out at you, you openly bring the, the response. The crusaders came openly on the Muslims. Allah didn't bring a secret force to fight them. He brought an open force, Nuruddin, openly announcing it. So the makr of Allah, the plot of Allah, is the, that the punishment is unseen. You're, you're, you're brought an unseen plot. You hid your plot, so Allah hid his response. That's the difference between iqab, right? When, when the, the adl of Allah and the makr of Allah. The adl and the iqab of Allah is that it's open right in front of you, your punishment. Because he treats you as you treated him. You treated the rights of Allah and what is sacred in our religion and what is sacred in the sight of Allah openly with open animosity, you will get an open pushback. You treat it and you try to plot secretly, likewise then Allah Ta'ala will put your punishment where you can't see it. That is the meaning of yamkurun wa yamkurullah. وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَكْرُ السَّيِّعُ إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ The plot of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala never... Uh, comes except to those who are planning and plotting. So as long as you're an honest and open person, you should never imagine that Allah is going to trick you. And this, the, 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 how do you know that that's not a plot? At the, see, at this point, the waswas of people can go crazy. Well, how do I know that his telling me that he is not going to plot against me isn't a plot? So the, you're, you're in a serious waswas and you need to learn a very important thing is that the word of Allah Ta'ala is true by necessity. It's not true because you trust it. You don't trust Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because trust is based upon assessment of a track record. 
We don't assess a track record of Allah. You can't. Okay. A prophet is deemed trustworthy and is deemed a prophet because of his miracles. Not because you're assessing his prophethood. You can't assess prophethood. You're not a prophet. Uh, a doctor is only assessed by other doctors. A regular guy like me cannot assess a doctor. A mufti is assessed by other muftis. Okay, And so who is going to make an assessment of the creator? So therefore, the word of the creator must be tr the truth by necessity, not by trust. Not by the claim that it's the truth. And the basic logic behind this is that the, the sifat of Allah, the attributes of Allah are one in themselves. They're one in themselves. He is not composed of parts. And from his attributes is his speech and his action and his knowledge. Hence, all of his speech and all of his actions, actions being the creation in the world, is in accord with his knowledge. His speech is in accord with his knowledge. The reality of the world is in accord with the knowledge, with his knowledge. When speech is in accord with the reality of the world as we see it, that's what we call the truth. Like this paper is white. Okay, the my, the word white came out of my mouth, and the paper actually is white. So that's what we call the truth. If I said that this paper is green, it's called kethib, whether it's accidental or not. Okay, it's kethib. It's false. It's important to un this is so important. To, to, to establish firmly down that the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by necessity true. And therefore, no concept that, oh, God's tricking me. Maybe this is all a big trick. All right. Next one. This is the last one. The siege of Medina of 1919. And this is in the time where of the First World War, and the city of Medina was part of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire joined the war with the Central Powers. Okay. In an attempt to weaken the Ottoman Empire, the Allies, okay, which is the French and the British, right? Who did they side with? They sided with, they created the Arab Revolt. They used the grievances they created grievances, exaggerated grievances, and the Ottomans weren't perfect at that time. Probably had some tr real grievances. And they provoked the Arab Revolt. And the Arab Revolt was led by a Sharif Hussein of Mecca. Unfortunately, a member of Ahlul Bayt here is the antagonist. And the traitor of the Ummah, really. It's pretty sad. And he's the future progenitor. He, he is the future uh, head of the nation of Jordan. They gave him as a consolation prize. He wanted, he was the chief of Mecca. See, here's the thing. He plotted against the Ottomans. They used him to plot against the Ottomans. When they didn't want him later on, when the Saudis came up and they preferred that, they bumped him off and they sent him and his lineage and they gave him a consolation prize, which is called the nation of Jordan. Okay. Not even a nation. It's just like a plot of land. All right, let's just circle it and call it Jordan. And you'd be the king there. Happy? Have some toys. Take some toys, and that's yours, right? Good. So Sharif Hussein was supported by British and French agents, and this is the era of T.E. Lawrence, all right? And they started to besiege Medina to conquer Medina. Take Medina from the Ottomans. So the, this is Muslims being now puppeted by the French and the British allied forces, to take Medina away from the Ottoman Empire. Who's fighting back? Fakhreddin Pasha. The hero of this story is Fakhreddin Pasha. Okay. And when you get us a chance, I want to give us an image of Fakhreddin Pasha. And he resisted for two years and seven months, pushing back this Arab revolt. Okay. And this started way back in 1914. A two-year dialogue known as the mcmahon Hussein Correspondence. So you're going to side with the Kuffar and you're going to fight the Ottomans. That's basically what happened. And the British offered them material support and they said, you will have a Hashemite kingdom, a Hashemite, Hashemite caliphate from Aden, or Aden down here, all the way up to Aleppo. All right. Listen, when Satan makes you a promise, it's a lie. 
And when the British Empire makes you a promise, it's a lie. Okay? <laughs> With increasing fears that the Ottomans were clamping down on these sub subversive Arab nationalists, Sharif Hussein staged a region-wide revolt in June of 1916. Let me, let's put it this way. Let's say Sharif Hussein wants to revolt against the Ottomans. That's not, the, that's not newsworthy, in a sense, because in history, it's not newsworthy. But the fact that the one behind him is the British and the French, that's a problem, right? Now, at that point, you realize that the enemy, uh, who is the greater enemy, should never support you against your rival. The prime objective of the initial result was to deprive the Ottomans' legitimacy of the Khilafah by taking Mecca and Medina away from them, okay? And the Arabs began to capture Mecca against the surprised but well-equipped Ottoman defenders, and that culminated in the Battle of Mecca, okay? And the Arabs successfully captured Mecca, all right, away from the Ottomans. The Arabs then turned their attention to Medina, which was defended by an even bigger Ottoman force, Okay, complemented by the strategic Hejaz Railway. Now listen to this. Do you want to know why the Arab world is in khizi, in humiliation? Is there one country in the Arab world that you say, I'm proud, this is an Arab country, right? Or all of them are worse than the other in some way, shape, and form. Now, it's not to say that you can't go have a good time in Egypt, that there are not some great things happening. Jordan is a very peaceful place, right? It's always... When, when you never hear of drama coming out of Jordan, there's a lot of great things happening in Jordan. But in world hist in the world stage right now, is it a place that, you know, gives you a lot of pride? I, I, I wouldn't think so. All right. I don't think so. So this is the origin. It's Khiana. The siege began in October 1916 when the Arabs, led by Hussein's son Faisal, were rep repulsed with heavy losses to the Ottomans, by the Ottomans who were fortified and armed with artillery in contrast to the mobile, irregular Arab force. This would prove detrimental as the Ottomans reinforced the city with thousands of soldiers and necessary supplies. The Ottomans tried to recapture coastal ports that were used to supply the Arabs, but were foiled by the British Royal Navy. At this point, Arabs, Arab and allied planners decided to lay siege to Medina instead of forcefully breaching it. Okay. The Ottomans were pinned down in the city. They were pinned in a siege while desperately protecting the Hijaz Railway, the only means of supply. By pinning the 12,000 Ottomans in Medina, it would leave other fronts much easier to win, such as Palestine, Sinai, Mesopotamia, and Aqaba. This is a massive ummah. Uh, uh, Umayyad Arab revolt against the Ottomans. For this pur purpose, Nuri as Sayyid, or as Sayyid, set about creating military training camps in Mecca under the direction of General Aziz Ali al Misri, using a mix of Bedouins and Arab officers and Arab Ottoman uh, deserters who defected the the uh, defected to the Arab revolt. Aziz Ali created three infantry brigades, a mounted brigade, an engineering unit, and three different artillery groups made up of a patchwork of varying cannon and heavy caliber machine guns. He had a total force of 30,000 people. Okay. Aziz Ali proposed that it be divided into three armies, an eastern army given to Prince Abdullah ibn Hussein, okay. a southern army by Ali ibn Hussein, okay. And they would form around Medina and the Northern Army, com com uh, commanded by Prince Faisal, all right, w would form a cordon around Medina from the north. These armies had elements of British and French officers attached to them. That's why you know the Baraka is not there, okay, who provided technical military advice. All right, one of these officers was the famous T.E. Lawrence. Over the course of the 1917-1918 Arab Revolt, the Arabs unanim uh, numerously attempted to sabotage the Hejaz Railway. Ottoman garrisons of the isolated small train stations withstood the continuous night attacks and secured the tracks against increasing number of strikes. There were 130 major attacks in 1917 and hundreds in 1918, including exploding more than 300 bombs on April 30th, 1918. The Arabs aided the British wherever they could. 
Their efforts paved the way for the British annexation of the Levant. Fools. With the resignation of the Ottoman Empire from the war, with the armistice of Mudros between the Ottoman Empire and the Entente, on the 30th of October 1918, it was expected that Fakhreddin Pasha would also surrender. But he refused, and he did not surrender even after the war, despite pleas and orders from the Ottoman Sultan. Okay. And here it is. This is where this thing becomes sacred. And it becomes part of our l- spiritual history. After the war, Fakhreddin Pasha was walking in the middle of the night, depressed, anxious, not knowing what to do now that he had lost support of the Sultan. He sat down by one of the homes in Medina and leaned his head on the wall and thereupon fell asleep. He reported then that he saw a vision of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ reached his hand out. Fakhreddin Pasha took his hand. The Prophet lifted him up. And he said, follow me. He walked with the Prophet three steps and the dream ended. Fakhreddin Pasha began then wondering on the meaning of this dream. And he realized the meaning of this dream is that he now reports directly to the Prophet ﷺ, meaning that he is no long he is no longer reporting to the Ottoman Sultan, and he now works directly for the cause of the Prophet ﷺ. This renewed his vigor, and he was able to hold out without any Ottoman support against the British and the French and the Arab revolt for two to three more months. Okay, two to three more months he was able to hold out on his own. And he considered that dream to be a sign that he was on the right track in defending the city. Don't stop defending the city and defend it until your death. Thereupon, the British were able to buy out some of his own soldiers who arrested him. Okay. Fakhruddin, general defender of the most sacred city of Medina, servant of the Prophet. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a letter. Okay. This is a letter Fakhruddin Pasha wrote. To Sharif Hussein of Mecca. Okay. In the name of Allah, the Omnipotent, to him who brokered the power of Islam, caused bloodshed amongst Muslims, jeopardized the Khilafah of the Amir al Mu'mineen, commander of the faithful, and exposed it to domination by the British. He's writing to the traitor of Mecca, the Arab revolt. Okay. On, the th- on Thursday night, the 14th of Dhul Hijjah, I was walking, tired and worn out, thinking of the protection and defense of Medina, when I found myself among unknown men working in a small square. Then I saw standing before me a man with sublime, with a sublime countenance. Okay. He was the Prophet wasallam. His left arm rested, rested on his hip under his robe. And he said to me in a protective manner, follow me. I followed him two or three paces. Okay. And then I woke up. I immediately proceeded to his sacred mosque and I prostrated myself in Salah near his tomb. I am now under the protection of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what he's saying to him. This, my, he is my supreme commander. I am busying myself with strengthening the defenses, building roads and squares in Medina. Trouble me not with your useless uh, offers. Sharif Hussain tried to buy him out. Trouble me not with your useless offers. The battle is renewed. He refused to hand over even his sword Okay. even upon receipt of direct order to do so by the Ottoman minister of war. This is one of our heroes. The Ottoman government was upset at his behavior. Sultan Muhammad VI dismissed him from his post. He refused to do so and kept the flag of the Ottoman Sultan flying over Medina for 72 days after the war. After the armistice of Mudros and the closest Ottoman unit was 1,300 kilometers away from Medina, the British eventually understood that they couldn't defeat Fakhreddin Pasha with military power because he had fortified the city. Instead, they had to bribe some of the soldiers in his army. And they arrested him on the 10th of January, 1919. Abdullah I of Jordan and his troops entered Medina on the 13th of January, 1919. After the surrender, the Arab troops looted the city for 12 days. Overall, 4,850 houses were locked and put 
uh, under seal by Fakhreddin Pasha. They were opened forcefully and looted. About 8,000 men of Turkish garrisons were evacuated out of Egypt, uh, evacuated to Egypt after their surrender. Besides the evacuated, some died of disease and others dispersed on their, from their own into various areas. The weapons and ammunition were left to the besiegers. So, you, Arab revolt, went against the Ottomans, used by the British, and what happens to you? What does the Prophet Sallallahu say? Whoever digs a ditch for his brother, he falls into it. There's an ancient Arab saying. So, give it four or five years and they're going to find a better stooge. They don't, they don't want this sophisticated Hijazi people to rule. Let's get the Nejdis and the Saudi, King Abdul Aziz bin Saud. And boom, you guys came in 1919 and you're going to be out by 1926 by the British. These people are betrayers, right? That's all they know how to do. And it's good that the legacy of this uh, betrayal by some members of Ahlul Bayt was short-lived so that history can't remember much of it and most people don't even know about it. So that they don't go down in history and have a whole empire now based upon treachery. No, kafara of their sins right away. Because even the murtakib al-kaba'ir, if he's Ahlul Bayt, you should hope that they get expunged, their sins expunged and... Uh, they show up on the day of judgment and meet their grandfather, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, having faced their uh, punishments in this world. So I'm actually interested to see how how did the Arab? Hey, could you look this up for me? How did the Arab revolt end? Like how did the the because the um, the Wahhabis eventually came in, uh, or the Sa Al Saud eventually came in and conquered and took over. So that's that's interesting. That may be something we can read. Right? How did that come to an end? Khiana begets Khiana. If you're a traitor, you're going to attract a traitor to yourself. For doing what? just uh, stay silent or you do support the Ottomans like this? Rebellion is in general almost always forbidden. Re rebellion is like almost always forbidden. You, 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 you fight against the rebellion. It doesn't mean you always support the uh, it, it, it's uh, it doesn't always uh, um doesn't always uh, mean that I support the ruler. Mm. Right. But we are against the rebellion. All right. Let's go to the, the, the Q&A. What do we got here? Hmm. Talk to me on internal speech is sent to humans how is it different from his knowledge or uh, meaning knowledge of what he will say say again so someone's asking before Allah's internal speech is sent to humans how is it different from his knowledge knowledge of what he will say no his speech is in accord with his knowledge and he does not always speak about everything that he knows right Asking what defines residency when talking about the fiqh of uh, Jama'ah for the khatib and followers. The fiqh of Jama'ah? What does it say? He's asking what defines residency when talking about the fiqh of Jama'ah for the khatib and the others, the followers. Sorry. Uh, it is residency is that you live in a city that is meant to be a city and you don't plan to leave. You're not like there just as a student or just there as a. Um, 
just as a uh, uh, working a, a temporary job, etc. All right, let's talk about Arcview soon, very soon. Okay. Um, very soon, Arcview will be splitting up into four parts. Arabic. Kids. Basic and plus. Basic is, I just want to learn my dean real quick. I want to start learning. Okay. Uh, plus is scholarship track. We're going to now have the second tier books in Aqidah and Fiqh. Third is kids. Hifz of Quran and plus Sira plus um, plus uh, uh, Fiqh, basic Tahara and Salah. Okay. Thirdly, fourthly, I mean, is a, a pure Arabic, all, only Arabic, nothing else. And that's going to be by Mahdi Lak. And we broke off the Arabic so that that could become like a little group that just focuses on Arabic. Okay. All right, keep going. Lesson, why did Allah permit the disciples of Sayyidina Isa السلام, to believe in his crucifixion despite it being fake? Repeat. Uh, why did Allah permit the disciples of Sayyidina Isa السلام, to believe in his crucifixion despite it being fake? What's the first half again? Why did he permit the disciples? Why did Allah permit the disciples of Sayyidina Isa to believe? How do we know that his disciples believed that? Later on, they believed that they they believed that. But how do we know that? We don't know that the Sahaba of Sayyidina Isa believed in his crucifixion. We have no knowledge of that. Uh, can we do a shikhara for more than one matter? Of course you can. Of course you can. Iqra. Read and have a laugh. What else we got here? Right, so I heard non-Muslims will not be able to enter Medina. Uh, Medina to Munawwara. I guess it's a comment. But like, uh, well, we know that, the dead, the, that they're not allowed to enter the sacred cities by Sharia, but we do know that the Dajjal will never be able to enter. Just because someone's not allowed to enter doesn't mean they won't manage to enter. But we do know that Dajjal will not enter the sacred city. Mecca, Medina. He's asking about Arcview. Can we do basic plus Arabic at the same time? I just started the summer semester on basic. I know very little Arabic, only how to read. Yes, if somebody, you can do multiple at the same time and there will be a discount for bundles like that. Someone does a bundle because we want to make it feasible for everyone to do. Okay. RQ plus in Maliki Fiqh Risalat ibn Abi Zaid in Shafi'i Fiqh uh, Ahmad ibn Naqib al Misri's book Reliance of the Traveler. Okay. In Hanafi Fiqh, whatever is the next level of Hanafi Fiqh, intermediate Arabic level. Maliki Fiqh? Yeah. But maybe in, I'm, I don't know yet who is teaching it, I decided who's going to teach it yet. Must read books for every Muslim. The Seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a must read book for every Muslim. And when I say Seerah, it really you you learn the Seerah by learning three or four different Seerahs, reading three and then listening to lecture series. Still, I think one of the best lecture series out there is the one by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Right. Um, I think it is uh, still one of the best. What should you do if you are not focused in your regular alim classes but like to read other Islamic books about tasawwuf and that? Well, I think that don't let shaitan trick you and being bored of fiqh. If you are bored of aqidah and fiqh and Arabic, then lower the dosage. No one's forcing you, but don't stop though. And just reading soft Islamic works that's not the way you must learn some Arabic some Aqidah some Fiqh if you're a student of knowledge right so if, but if you're so bored of it and tired of it decrease the dose you're not racing here right they on some videos too a lot of people uh, they tend to not get as bored of watching videos watch videos there are lectures on videos right 
Yes, a twelve year a twelve year old who is not baligh yet wants to pray Isha, but it enters past his bedtime. If he stays up for Isha, he's falling asleep at school the next day. What should he do? Mashallah. Young boy, he falls asleep because he stays up for Isha. I'll tell you what to do. You pray Maghrib at eight fifteen. Go to sleep. In the same way that you wake up for Isha, Fedge, you wake up fresh. Around 9.30, 9.45. Not gym. Go make wudu prayer. So he's already slept himself an hour. Or at least he's powered down. And he his, he's not stimulated his brain. So that's that's how you do it. Could you recommend a book on the history of Medina? Yes. The, this was based upon a book called The History of Medina Munawar by Muhammad Abdul Ghani. Muhammad Abdul Ghani. A lot of what's in here was based upon that. sister-in-law she passed away today she's leaving young children behind she's a, a recurring viewer of ours mm, uh, one of the, f- uh, the viewers Maham Mas'ud's sister sister-in-law sister-in-law passed away inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun leaving behind sisters uh, children Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them jannat al without any hisab may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those children and make their hardship uh, caused for their entering Jannah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them reunite with their family and, and with their mother in Jannah til Firdaus um, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give great reward to everybody who helps take care of those those kids and those children <coughs> are Caleb Ezekiel and Samuel prophets in Islam were they prophets of many Israel Hizqil is mentioned, yeah, in the Arabic works. Hizqil, he's mentioned. And he's a Dhul Kifl. Thank you. Hizqil is treated in the Arabic world as Dhul Kifl. Uh, in the Quran as Dhul Kifl, mentioned. As for Caleb and Samuel, la adri. Samuel is said to be the prophet at the time of Sayyidina Dawood, and he's the prophet that they say is the one who chose, that they said, give us a king, and he chose for them. He said the sign of the monarchy from Allah is with Talut. And they still got ups- upset about that. They still didn't accept it. Can we have a separate session on the Ottoman Empire? We'd have to have many sessions, but yes, why not? Okay. The mountain overlooking the Masjid of Medina, what is the significance of that in the Dajjal minion slash his minions? There is a hadith about the salty tract being the place where Dajjal settles his army there and tries to attack Medina but cannot and Allah knows best uh, how do I contact arcview.org yeah we have uh, arcview will be answered by Sister Tasneem any questions you have arcview uh, will be answered by Sister Tasneem can we do basic and Arabic at the same time yes and you will have um, a discount for those bundles what is the name of the program it's called arcview Arabic and it'll be run by Sheikh Mahdi Lak. I highly advise everyone to take it. Okay. Is Ryan not around? No, Ryan went off abroad to study, but Sister Tasneem and her team will take over uh, answering those questions. Can I say Allah make a lot of path to him even if you astray multiple times? There are another path to him and Allah, the one that created the path and know you are going to choose by your free will. Um, we have, we act we make our own choices by the will of Allah. We have a free will by the will of Allah. We don't have a free will autonomous from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, this is the meaning of وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ We have a will because Allah has willed that we act on our own. That's what it is. Allah has willed that we act on our own. That's how we, com- we understand that we have a free will but we're not autonomous. It is the will of Allah that we act on our own. That we have our own free will. Could you ask? Okay, we read about that. Um, Said man, what do you have to say? You know what I need to do is I really need to get my book out there on uh, intro to Ashari Aqidah. Key to Paradise it's called, or Key to the Garden. I can't remember what it called it, but I need to get that book out there again. Okay. How many books do you have actually out there? Oh, I have. 
Sacred Sources, which is Introduction to Ulum al-Quran, Ulum al-Hadith. I have two books in Intro to Arabic Grammar, Hashmawiya with reading exercises. I have Intro to Tajweed. In, that's a short, very short booklet. Aqidah for Youth. Intro to Maliki Fiqh, All the Abwab. Um, intro, uh, Aqidah, Aqidah of the Guard, the Aqidah book. Intro to Usul al-Fiqh. Eight total books. And none of them published because I just wanted to marinate. And then you can never like get around to, to doing it because you always want to tweak something here and there. But now we're going to start, now that we have Safina Press going. And our, our first book with Safina Press, inshallah, is going to be... Um, it's going to be uh, Nas's book, Pearls at the Bottom of the at the Bottom of the Sea. You wrote a book? Yeah. Hello? Really? Uh, oh, uh, I forgot to do it. I'll do it tonight. No, believe it or not, my my wallet fell and I lost all my cards. Yeah, were most of my cards. Okay. Another avenue, guys. All right, I'll call you tonight. Okay. You're welcome. All right, all right, bye. (sighs) Such a random call. (laughs) I want the heater paid for, the heating permit paid for, like months ago. Which one? Oh, uh, it's about the problem of evil. Really? Oh, that's yep. Really that was going to be really good. Shocking to read of rape and pillage of Medina by Muslim armies. Yes. Yeah. People can go astray quickly. I did a whole binge on the problem of evil like yesterday. Um, yeah. This, this book is something else. Yeah. Sheikh Hasra liked it too. He read it. He approved it. And he's going to write the forward. Yeah. Really? Yep. A 12-year-old who is not bad, we answered that question. Why did things scroll up like that? <sighs> Are Ilyasin and Ilyasa the same person? Ilyasa is different from Ilyasin, but Ilyasin is considered to be Ilyas. What is... what? History book do you suggest from the first war of the Ridda? Probably a Siyuti's book. Short uh, summary of what happened uh, on the Ridda wars. We need a book list. Yes, we always need a, a reading list. Yeah, yes, we, we need that reading list. What's the program for ArcView Arabic? Beginners, intermediate, advanced. Any, every, all levels can take it. How do you respond to people calling you a hypocrite? Mm, it's not always wrong to call someone a hypocrite if you mean the hypocrisy of action. As for the hypocrisy of beliefs, that's only known to Allah. We can see signs of that, but that's known to Allah. But the hypocrisy that we're allowed to say is the hypocrisy of action. Meaning, you openly said something and you openly did the opposite. Not by suspicion, but by knowledge. That person, you say, this is munafiq. Munafiq al-af'al. Not munafiq al-i'tiqat. Okay. Was the Himyar the ancient king of Yemen? Yes, Himyar, yes. Was one of the ancient kings of Yemen, yes. I heard there's a three-year requirement for residency as well. Um, I don't know what, what he's talking to. He must be talking to somebody else. How's uh, in- Instagram saying, saying, doing? How do we remember what we learn in books? How do we remember what we learn in books is that you have to repeat reading the books. Like you got, you got to, when you, when you study a book, you don't read it once. Once is for discovery. Then you do a second reading and a third reading and a fourth reading and a fifth reading and a sixth reading and a seventh reading. Right. That's truly how the knowledge of a book really marinates in your head. So you got to have sabr. 
requires patience. It's not something that's just, I'm going to read a book and finish it. You know how many people read a single book and cannot tell you a th one thing? They read a book one time and they cannot tell you a single thing about a book. Like, it's extremely common. Are there any, like, categories of books where it's like, you don't have to, like, do that? And it's just, like, kind of like fun time reading? Yeah. What kind of Social category? commentary books. Social commentary types of books, right? You read that once and that's it. But a book like a book like this, people just you read it for your for rest of your life. You always be reading from it. Your books of fiqh, you always read. Tafsir is not something you have to. You're gonna read different tafsir all the time. Sira, you different siras all the time. But you always need to be reading. Right. How do I stop the voice in my head from doubting God's mercy when a dua I've been making for years is very close to coming true? My doubts keep reminding every time, every other time when the dot was going to be answered, but was not. Well, you have to continue to recite to yourself the merits, and the, the only avenue we have is husna dhanna billah, good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the main thing here? The good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different from the good opinion of other people. I may have a good opinion of my neighbor that he's going to be nice. Okay? But it may be tr false. He might not be nice, right? Um, but the husn of dhan billah haqiqah, that's the difference. The husn, Having a good opinion of Allah is the truth. Okay? And remember the Prophet ﷺ promised, your dua will be answered as long as you don't rush it. The Sahaba said, what is rushing? He said, is when one of you stops making dua and said, I made dua, but Allah didn't answer me. That is the one who rushes and that is the one whose dua is never answered. So if you want your dua answered, don't worry about Allah's action. He's going to answer me, he's not going to answer me. No, don't worry about this. You worry about your action which is to not stop making dua and to keep having husn done. What's your business with what Allah does, right? No, your business is what you do. This is what the saying of Ibn Umar. لا يهمني الإجابة إنما يهمني الدعاء. Okay. Um, uh, the, the dua is, the, the ijaba is Allah's action. That's no business. I have no business with that. I have business with my own action. Okay. What's the best way of learning sarf and nahu? Because it gets boring at times. I like reading Arabic works. You always, this is one of the reasons why it's good to mix up your routines. You never want to get bored with a religious science. So you study a little dosages, small dosages, and you mix it up with other things so that you never get bored with it. It's, uh, it's like meat is good for you sometimes, right? But if it's dry, it's still good for you, but you don't want to eat it dry. So cut it up into small pieces, put some sauce, right? Put some rice around it. All of a sudden, you can eat a lot of dry meat. Like if you have a dry piece of a steak, you can't eat that. It doesn't taste good. So you, like a dry steak. Although it's a steak, you know you should eat it. It's good for you, but you can't. It's too dry. Or chicken breast, when it's like white meat that's dry. So what do you do? You cut it up into small pieces. Put some sauce on it. Throw some rice around it. Okay? All of a sudden, you could eat it really easily. So anything that's difficult, cut it up into small parts and then cover it up with something, right? And there's a way where you could actually psychologically link yourself. So one, one time I couldn't get one of my kids to, 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 to study a certain subject and it was miserable. We'd have these tutoring sessions that would always end up <laughs> in misery, right? So I said, you know what? We need to change the association. And we started to go... It's the depth of the winter here, right? Like January, sitting at the kitchen table trying to do math. This is misery, right? So I said, you know, let's change this up. Let's go. We went out. We went to, to out to the coffee shop and got hot chocolates and did the math there. Oh, well, all of a sudden, this is great, right? You got to have a hot chocolate. Like, why does it have to be a punishment, right? If someone doesn't know how to do a math problem, why is that? Why are they wrong? There's nothing wrong with it. There's, nothing, there's like no moral crime there. Right, yelling at them because they don't understand the math problem. How is that? How have they done anything wrong? They, just, they don't get it. So you're not going to be able to think if you're just in such a miserable state. So let's go out. 
Let's get some hot chocolates, change scenery. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 hour and a half went by of doing meth, right? And it also, you're in the middle of the coffee shop, so you're not going to be, no one's going to be raising voices, yelling, banging, right? As uh, parents always do when their kid doesn't understand a basic math equation. Is there any valid opinion, says Adam, from any Adam, that it is permissible, permitted to touch people of the opposite gender? No. If there is, as a default ruling, the answer is no, but there are exceptions. What are the exceptions? The dire need, for example. Okay. For example, if you have a, 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 a woman drowning in a pool and there's no one else to save her except you, it becomes permitted, right? Because someone's going to die. This dire need, of course. Dire need sometimes, it comes in in less than dire need, but it's almost like you have no choice, such as when you go for an x-ray or something and you're in the hospital. You can't go around asking, I don't want this tech, I want that tech, right? I don't want this person touching me, I want that. Sometimes you can't do that. And hence, you have no uh, no haraj against you when that happens. It's not your choice. Go to the dentist appointment and lean back and starts cleaning your teeth and, and you don't have a choice who the dentists choose for you. Okay, so those types of things, inshallah, we will be forgiven for them. But uh, the intentional touching is what we will be judged about. What are your thoughts on Mustafa Kemal Ataturk? Is this going to be another one where I get a raid of messages as I did on Friday? For <laughs> you, How dare you have a bad opinion out your beloved Imran Khan? If you are one of those who are... Go back to the beginning of the podcast. Okay. But um, uh, Kamal Ataturk is one of the killers of the Islamic heritage and one of the um, situations where a man who came and fought the British after the World War and pushed them out of Turkey and saved Turkey from colonization from the British. So he was elevated from that perspective. The Turks considered him a savior from that perspective. Then he turns around and he becomes the probably the single greatest enemy of Islam of the century, canceling the Arabic language, uh, killing or jailing many scholars, disallowing any symbols of Islam, canceling the event. How about... Uh, and, and, and he originates, and this is actually a, a closer to a fact. You know the Arabs, everyone who's bad is a Jew, right? It's just like a, a go-to layup, right? He's a Jew. No, but he actually comes from a group of people who were Jews in Istanbul who... And eventually entered into Islam, right? But their origin was that. Now, does that impact his action? What well, doesn't make a difference? He did what he did. And by the way, you have to be a Jew to do bad things and against Muslims. We just read about the Battle of Al Harra, right? So this this type of um, quick knee jerk reaction. But the thing is, maybe one day we'll read that history about a mystic who caused trouble in the Ottoman Empire. And was basically told, enough of your 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 rabble rousing and your trouble, okay? And he said, okay, okay, I'm a Muslim. And him and his like 300 followers all entered Islam. And that's it became like a group. And that group, it's this is in Wikipedia. This is not just like Alex Jones level stuff. This is actual recorded history. That group became a force in the army and in the state, and he's one of them. So does that group hold a hidden resentment against Islam that trickled down from generation to generation? Likely. Okay. But anyway, he became the single greatest enemy of Islam of his time. There are a lot of people who butchered and killed scholars but never actually attempted to alter and end the, 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 uh, the, uh, the religion and, and cancel the Adhan and things like this. Okay. What happened to the women? What do the Yazids do from a Sunni perspective? Please clarify. I don't understand that question. What about those who betray the Muslims? 
like those who attacked Medina? Is it possible they were hypocrites? Hypocrites of action, for sure. He called that you're a Muslim and then act like that. But major sinners, at the very least, we can say. Medni 786, is it imagination when faced with bias for our religion at work? How do we respond to it as they don't mention religion, but just keep you from progress and lack of support? And it's called like the glass ceiling when you're at a job and you're just not going to pass that. I would say to you that um, talk to the people in the fields, in the area where you live, in the industry you work in, because they're going to know the details. Yep. What's worse, the zendaka or nifaq? What is worse, zendaka or nifaq? Someone asked this before, but uh, I was going to ask. Mm. Read it off. Yeah. It came to my mind. Ik, um, we know that al munafiqin fi dark al asfari min al nar. The hypocrites are in the lowest hellfire. Does that does that mean that does not mean they're alone in the lowest hellfire, right? So, Allahu alam what is worse. But the munafiq is within Ahl sunnah right? He may have a worse impact upon us. The zindiq, we know, that that's like Nazari Ismailis or whatever. We know that that's like sort of a joke. Like it's so far out, no one's going to be affected by Qadianis. Is Qadiani a big fitna in the community? Not really. For, so we have to separate between the impact in this world and what Allah has said about them in terms of the wrong action itself, right? So, in the sight of Allah, like what you have done with the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the zindiq would be worse, right? But when it comes to harming the ummah, the munafiq would be worse. Can we have a stream about the muqaddim of Ibn Khaldun? Yeah, good topic, inshallah. Is Martin Ling's okay to read? Yes, but you can read the corrections on it by GF Haddad on the internet. Cap Muslim says, uh, should we pray for the guidance of all humanity when the Holy Quran says that Allah does not guide an oppressive people? Yes, you can you, you, you can make dua that Allah guides them away from their oppression too. How to feel when one can't progress in life when others are succeeding? Don't Thinking about others means you're not thinking about yourself. Thinking about others, looking at others means you're not working yourself. So just focus on yourself. You have a sphere of influence and a sphere of concern. All that matters really is your sphere of influence. Like, what can I do for myself? <sighs> Lily Rose says, what about the line in the Quran when Prophet Nuh asks Allah for something and God essentially says no to it? Then you're talking about when he made du'a for his son and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala s- said uh, he he's not your son he's not from your people he's a bad deed okay and so uh, that is a situation where you stop making du'a for something because Allah told you but Allah that that's something that's unique for Prophet Nuh, right? That's not us. No one's going to receive a revelation in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says him no. And secondly, it's in the past already. He died. There is nothing to do. He was just asking what happened. He wasn't taking permission to make dua for him. What is our view about the famous Quran translator Abdul Yusuf Ali? The 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 translation of Yusuf Ali and the footnotes, the footnotes had many errors in it. Because he started his life off outside of Ahl Sunnah with some other sects. But he became a Sunni Muslim. And was Amana publication corrected the footnotes? They took anything that was heretical outside the footnotes, so it became a book that is possible for people to read. Uh, any works you recommend on the topic of loneliness and lack of friends and community? Hmm. What do you guys know about that? 
you can read the virtues of seclusion, yeah, on how to benefit from that. But I don't, I don't think you need books on that. I think you actually need, the book may make it worse. You need to actually go out and be active and learn how to talk. Many people don't know how to talk. So how do you talk? You say, Salaam Alaikum, you smile at someone. You ask a question. Not and and you have to understand there's a barrier of questions. Were you just jogging or something? No, I'm just reading. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. Um, well, that's a good little exercise trick. Um, you have to learn what is a level of a non-invasive question, right? And you start asking those questions, and people should understand this is just creating conversation, right? And if there are Muslim who understands the nature of suhba, they should reciprocate, right? And you have to know that barrier, though, and you can't pass into invasive questions. And you have to know what is too much and too little, right? And you have to be able to read that body language. So when you sit someone next to somebody and you ask them a simple question, how are you? Pretty good. You wait to see what they answer. If they're just answering one word, they don't want to talk. So you leave them alone. But if they answer and then they ask ba- ask you a question back or they make an observation, right? Then you know they want to talk. Right? So conversation, in my opinion, starting up a conversation is a little bit of an art, but I think it can be broken down into a science, right? Where it's like principles. Like ask, smile first, wait, ask a non-invasive question, now gauge the answer. If the person just gives you a one-word answer, they don't want to talk, so leave them alone. Right, if the person answers you and then adds to it, right, um, like you sit down and you say, oh, "I hope this is going to be a good flight," and the person says, "Yeah, you should have seen the flight I was in last time." Okay, they want to talk, right? So now, when they say that, you also have to reciprocate that, right? How? Tell a story of your own. Ask a question about it. People love to talk about themselves. You want to make friends? Ask them about themselves. Make them the topic. And if you make yourself the topic, people don't necessarily want to talk about you. They want to talk about themselves. They want to tell you about their own story. So keep asking, well, what, then, what happened after that? What happened after that? Uh, how did you handle that? All of a sudden, he feels like this is a great conversation because I'm the protagonist of this little story that I'm telling. Then you could share a little story about yourself, but not too much. Because also is suspicious when all the information flow is coming one way. That's suspicious, Right. Like, you're asking all the questions, and he's given all this information. But hey, we don't know anything about you. This is like, he feels like you're a spy or something, right? So you have to volunteer something from yourself every once in a while. But you really have to understand the level of where is too much and where is too little, because that also freaks people out. Yeah, well, your first time talking to someone, well, my mom died when I was five. Oh, I don't need this, I right? Like <laughs> okay. Right. You don't know what to say, like. Yeah, it's like, man, that's too much. No, it's, too it's, do- it's done with. It's dead in the water at this point because there's no way I can reciprocate that. I might. You want a hug? Do you want some sympathy? I don't even know you, What's your right? Name, like? Yeah, I don't even know your name. I don't know anything about you. Now you're telling me the sob story of your life, right? And it's mesquite when people uh, repeatedly make this mistake in life. Repeatedly, no one has ever taught them when to turn to put the brakes on, right? Or how about people who immediately within boom the, they, they give you their politics right immediately they give you their or they'll they'll, they'll take an opinion on a on a, a tough issue Something right like controversial yeah like i get on the get on the airplane hey where are you headed oh i'm, I'm going to fight abortion man like we really <laughs> want to get into this right now a subtle yeah, yeah. A subtle passive type of way it's like you know? by the way yeah it's I, like I, Joe Biden, you know. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Talking about Biden and uh, and and making you know that they're tr- they're Trump people or they're they're right wing people. It's like, do I need to go this route right now? I don't even. We don't even. We don't know each other, and I don't want to go into this, right? So these people are. When you sense that, save yourself the trouble and and close that door pretty quick, right? Whatever it is, when they make you uncomfortable by going too much too far, right? So, um, too much, too fast, I should say. It's crazy how, like, these social skills are, like, a distinguishing factor nowadays. Yeah. When, back in the day, this is probably just, like, if, if you didn't know this, you're just a weirdo. Everyone yeah. had social skills. Today has to be taught. Today, it's, like, like for interviews, for example, right? Like yeah. I'm in the CS field. 
Mm-hmm. You look at 90% of these guys, like, they know how to code and everything, but they cannot speak at all. No, they can't. Like, they get into an interview, they know all this stuff, yep. but, like, they start stuttering the first second. And wow, they don't know how to talk. They don't know how to talk. It's, it's crazy. They have no social skills. So, yeah. like, the one who has this, it's such a good, like, adva- it gives you such an it's advantage. It's such an advantage. It's such an advantage. A- and here's the thing. How easy is it, too? Like, walk in the room, have make sure your head is up, not arched down so that people don't think you're confident, you're, you're lacking confidence, and look the people in the eye, and just say, greet them, whether Muslim or not. Like, you're going to greet them in different, however you greet them, with a smile. That's it. How simple is that? And when a teenager does that, he looks so mature. All of a sudden, everyone puts him here. Because teenagers tend to walk in, mumble, and they don't smile, right? But when they get used to walk in a room, smile at the person, and, and then when they, they always say, oh, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Ask a generic question. How are you feeling today, Right? Say a generic thing. The weather's great out today. Like Anyone could say these things. You want to uh, learn social skills? Hang out with people in advertising and business. right? Because they're the ones who need social skills to survive. People who need to sell you something. <laughs> oh, that's true. So many people... So many people have a type of false haya and uh, and the religious people come off sometimes as awkward for that reason, right? Like there was a, a teacher once in the local Islamic school complained to me. She said, I taught kids for years and as soon as they start taking classes and they see me in the hall of the masjid, they're, they're doing this, right? They're walking down like this. And it's like, I'm old enough to be their mom and their grandma. And they're lowering the gaze with me, right? And they're saying that about, like, someone who was their teacher for third grade and fifth grade and stuff like that, right? It's almost like w- they they don't know where to put the line yet. And that's where you only learn that stuff by living and making mistakes. El Finlandi from Finland says, should we finish RFV basically before moving to RFV Plus? Yes. When it comes to the aqidah and the fiqh test, you have to finish the intro level before you go to the higher level. Okay. Please start a movement of Muslims to cooperate with each other. We need a guild. What did you think of the guild or the um, fraternity that called themselves Alif Lam Mim? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fraternity uh, called Alif Lam. You know, they, they always go by Phi Beta Cap and all these... Greek letters. Is is that right though to call it a verse of Quran? I don't think so. You're gonna put on the t-shirt. Where's that t-shirt going when it's dirty? In the laundry with your underwear? Kufi to say Alif Lam Mim. What do you think about that? I don't think the Quran should be used in those places that could be thrown around, you know. A shirt can be thrown around. But the title of your frat is Alif Lam Mim. So I don't know what that uh, uh what the what the ruling is on that. But anyway, it is a Muslim fraternity that they want to help other Muslims. So there, forget the name aside. You can you can go to college and start your own um, chapter of Alif Lam Mim. Let's look look let's look up the uh, stat the status of Alif A L M. Isn't that a sickness though? A L M. A L M. Like the ice bucket challenge. Yeah. Isn't that ALS? ALS, ALS sorry. ALM fraternity. Ice bucket challenge. Every college has one? Okay, but like we know what's going on in these frats. So like this is an Islamic one. But what are they about? That's what we need to know. If so they're doing all that stuff, like then definitely that's a no. No, no, they're they're trying to actually be an Islamic fraternity. They're trying to take back the narrative of frats. Is that what they're doing? Yeah, like uh like Salah. Mashallah. Yeah, s- help each other out. I wonder how the other frats look at it. Like, you got all these frats competing, dr- you know, yeah. stuff. drinking and stuff. Yeah, drinking and stuff. Okay, so Elif Lam Mim. Okay, they did change it. Alpha Lam Damu. <laughs> what? Okay. Also known as Elif Lam Mim. And their symbol is the sandal of the prophet with Elif Lam Mim written it, awesome. in it. Okay. Connecting, building, and sustaining a lifelong brotherhood as the first Muslim interest fraternity in America. Okay. The word fraternity is brotherhood and it's ukhuwa in Arabic. So this is the thing where they just took something that existed in the world and they try to flip it, right? And try to make something good out of it. 
potential for young men has to be of great benefit in society, but that potential needs support. Okay. And blah, blah, blah. Now, why don't we, who, who, the New York times covered this thing and their thing is to wear a red kufi and a, uh, uh, that's their thing. And they do marches. The New York times covered them. All right. Huffington post covered them. I guess they got the same thing that people said about them for the Alif Lam Bim being a verse of Quran, so they made it Alpha Lam Damu. We should make one at Rutgers. Make why don't we get the guy here, um, the founder of this frat? I mean, he needs he needs uh, some support here. We can get our own building and stuff. Yeah. Hamim. Hamim. But but MSA is a club and this is a frat. Different, right? I don't know, they're still, they're still, they're still see each other like that. Frats get like their whole a building, you know. Yeah. Like we should do one. All right, National Shura has the following members. All right, who's the chief? The there's a lot of different people from a lot of different universities. UTD. Yeah, UT Dallas. UT Dallas. Most of them are at UT Dallas. Another one is a college here. I can't really see what the logo is. Okay, can you, can, what's his name? Hamed? Hamed you know. All right, bring him on. Let's uh, see what this organization is all about. Huh? We need one at Rutgers. Yeah, we need one. So let's promote this. Let's give him a little promo because it's a good intention. Sadaf Islam, National Director of Standards. National Amir is Hamed Fazlani. Okay, uh, Tawfiq Shiliwala, uh, maybe related to ours, Shiliwala, Muhammad Madani, Iman, okay, Bidhindi, Junaid Ha, Omar Suhail, Shahriyar Ajmal, and then they have advisors. So I think it's a general, it's a general Muslim, keep, they probably seems that they just keep it really um, simple. Right, and I don't think that they have. Um, oh, they have a national. They have a ziara. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what? A ziara traveling to spread Alpha Lambda Mu, the colonization program. All right, it's to familiarize the principles of of this organization. All right, let's go to the next section. It is interesting. All right, national retreat. Okay, they have a national retreat. They spend time away from normal life. The prophets always took uh, retreats. Okay, but there's no no much detail on what the next retreat is. Let's take a look at the national conference. Who's speaking there? Not much. Yagama, yeah, update your website. Uh, they're into the Alim program, American Learning Institute for Muslims, with Obedullah Evans. Okay. okay. Yeah. Don't. Uh, they have. Oh, guess what their month is. Hey, listen to this. Uh, some uh, guess what their month is. Their, the month in which they do their activity. No. <laughs> October. Oh my. October. October. A K H Tober. Okay, that's their national philanthropic event that takes place all throughout the month of October in 2022. October focused on benefiting women's shelters and victims of domestic abuse um, across the nation. Four out of seven active chapters collected 11K. Okay. And they had UT Austin raise the most during their inaugural October. All right. So where are they? Uh, they're in Wisconsin. They're in ASU. They're in UT Austin, UT Dallas. They're represented in, in four colleges. Four universities. Okay. So bring the guy on. We'll, we'll see what it's all about. Regional retreat. Again, nothing yet out there for the regional retreat. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 3 o'clock. We finished today talking about the seven times in which Medina and Munawwara was attacked or intended to attack, to be attacked. And we talked about um, originally, or we went back earlier and we did talk about, uh, we read Imran Khan's statement about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the United Nations, which inshallah will be in his, the mizan of his hasanat. And with that, we will wrap up and we will come back to you tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, same time, 
same place. Jazakum Allah khairan everyone. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Kalbe shifa beyram